and we are live i apologize i'm a few seconds late uh, my computer came back from repair at lenovo never buy the nova computers this is my last one and getting everything working was odd for example um if the uh, picture is correct i have this weird yellowish complexion nowadays that i don't think i had before i turned this camera on so i don't know uh anyhow uh thank you for joining us uh, this will be somewhat unusual uh, show for the Dark Lord of Optics channel, since we're not going to be talking about uh, optics or Dark Lords, really. We will be talking about Ukraine. Uh, normally, I do that on my locals website. Uh, but I have uh, decided to do one here, since I have a couple of interesting guests. Uh, there are two guests. One of them is already waiting in the back. Another one still uh, still needs to join. I am not an expert on military affairs, and what's happening in Ukraine from a military standpoint is baffling me, baffling me beyond uh, anything I expected. So I figured I'm going to get a couple of guys here who can shed some light on that. Uh, the first one that I'm going to add uh, in a couple of minutes, once he gives me the OK, is Eugene. Uh, so for background, Eugene is my cousin. We both grew up in uh, uh, the former Soviet Union and came here when we were teenagers. Uh, he does all sorts of interesting technical things for a living, but he also uh, ended up going to Iraq as a part of the uh, Marine Corps to help overthrow Saddam Hussein. So his understanding uh, of the military end of things is likely to be significantly uh, better than, uh, than mine. Uh, the third gentleman uh, we're trying to add uh, to this live cast is uh, Dima Medved, and I think he's not on here yet, so we'll see. Uh, he was a captain in the Ukrainian paratroopers, and he uh, served during, I assume, the festivities in 2014-15. I'm not entirely sure which years he served, but he was involved in the conflict when the Donetsk and Luhansk uh, areas were trying to break away, well, I guess succeeding uh, with Russian help in breaking away from uh, the Ukraine. He was wounded in action, if I understand this correctly. Uh, he was uh, you know, blown up, essentially. He's now paraplegic. He somehow ended up in the U.S., I think, two or three years ago. And Eugene uh, knows him uh, through some other matters. But I also know that he fairly regularly talks to his uh, friends and uh, uh, compatriots back in Ukraine. So he probably has a much better a first-hand knowledge of what is really happening there, admittedly from a strongly pro-Ukrainian uh, perspective, okay, which I really don't mind, because in this case, I probably also have a pro-Ukrainian perspective, um, something that uh, something that my wife asked me a little while back, how do you know you are unbiased? I never pretended to be unbiased. I'm absolutely biased. Okay, so here, uh, Dima is... Uh, trying to connect all right so while they are working out the technical difficulties i am going to continue giving you a little bit of background but anyhow so i'm not unbiased right i'm not necessarily pro-ukrainian i'm definitely anti-russian always have been uh, probably well while living in america and while living in russia which is one of the reasons i'm no longer in russia what we have here the reason I decided to do this one and I frame the discussion the way I did is that I don't understand what's happening. So when uh, this whole buildup was happening, I was absolutely convinced that we're not going to see a full scale war because a full scale war is risky and makes no sense. Right. And then when the war happened, the only logical, um, the only real logical explanation is, OK, so they needed to end this war quickly. They needed basically to topple Ukrainian government, uh, kill or capture uh, the president of Ukraine and you know whatever other uh, top end uh, political and military leaders they have and destroy the Ukrainian uh, air force and basically you know the, the key, th key paths to resistance that had to be done within hours, not really days. And uh, it didn't happen. Why it didn't happen is actually an interesting question, and I hope that once uh, we get everybody online, uh, we'll be able to work that out. But 
it is a simple fact that it didn't happen. I'm going to show you a couple of pictures. All right, Mr. Ted Winkle is here. Good to see you, sir, on the oh, Cyclops. Joe, Joe, I've been talking about you all of last week while I was in Texas with the good folks at Acufire and IRA and a few others. Uh, but anyhow, I'm going to show you a couple of pictures. Let me uh, let me pull them up. And these are the maps of uh, what was happening during the first day, and uh, the 24th, and uh, basically the uh, um, kind of shows you a map of the Russian incursion. Yes, excellent. This is from February 24th. And let me share that. There we go. So this was pulled off some social media sources, right? So this was uh, the red was the Russian incursions. Let me see, do you guys see my mouse? You see it. Okay. So the uh, the controversial breakaway areas of Ukraine, Donetsk and Lugansk are here. This is where uh, Adima, the gentleman who we're trying to get connected, uh, this is where he ended up serving. This is an area called Sumy. It's another you know, area in the border of Ukraine and Russia. It's a military presence there, so Russian troops went there. Big push here from Belarus of all places. So Belarus, while well, officially they may not be at war with Ukraine, but in practical terms they are, right? So this is a push here. This is a side where they took over the Chernobyl area for reasons I don't fully understand. Okay, I think we have Mr. Dmitro online. He will tell us how he wants to be referred. But anyhow, so this is uh, just to show you guys. So this is was uh, on the 24th. And on the 26th, this is what we have. A little bit more. Not that much more, right? Uh, the country the size of Russia, if they haven't gotten further than this in three days, there's something weird happening. It's bad planning, bad combat readiness. Uh, I don't know. Anyhow, I'm going to uh, stop the screen. Gentlemen, nod, please, if you are ready to join. Yes? Dima, the Gatov. Okay, so here's Eugene. Howdy. And uh, Dmitra, are you ready? And Dmitra, all right. Can I switch? Да, все слышу, абсолютно. Вы меня слышите? Да, мы вас слышим. So, uh, gentlemen, for those of you watching, uh, Dmitry is in the United States for probably not very long. So, some of the discussion is going to be in Russian, and uh, Eugene and I will translate and will help formulate things in English the best we can. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Excellent. All right. So, my first basic question What the fuck is happening? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, uh, yeah. Like, uh, I, uh, this is. Uh, this is weird, right? Russia is not getting anywhere. Ukraine is putting out remarkable resistance. It seems like successful resistance, right? And the new sources for us are scarce. Do you talk to people back in Ukraine? Do you have any first-hand information you can share? Да, конечно, я всегда поддерживаю связь. То есть сейчас на данный момент телефон в просто разрывается, поскольку моя семья сейчас сидит э, под обстрелом, потому что, э, насколько стало известно, э, информация прошла, что э, у Путина сейчас стоит задача либо взять, либо стереть с лица земли Харьков, либо то же самое сделать с Киевом. То есть какой-то из этих городов должен быть сегодня сложен или сломлен. Но поскольку человек военный и имел отношение к войне непосредственно с 2014 года по 2015, то я с уверенностью могу сказать полностью, что это просто не получится. Это... Okay. Давай мы теперь переведем. Ага, я буду тогда да. поменьше, я понял. Не, не, нормально. Юджин, go for it. Yeah, what, what Dmitry said is uh, he constantly in contact with both uh, military people and people on the ground, his family in, in Kharkov. Uh, currently, today, the objective uh, set forth by Putin is that either Kharkov or Kiev need, need to fall. Uh, uh, Dmitry says that he's comfortable, it's not going to happen. Uh, but obviously, there's a lot of heavy fighting taking place. Uh, uh, Dima, where is your family? Kharkiv. Kharkiv. 
So right in the middle of it all. Okay. Okay. So we are in a. Мы на вы или на ты, я не знаю. Я так давно в Америке... На ты, на ты, на ты, на ты, на ты, на ты, на ты. Замечательно. Ты уверен, что Харьков и Киев не падут? Нет, конечно, естественно. Полностью, полностью уверен на все сто процентов. На все сто процентов. Потому что российская армия... В общем, что произошло? Дабы, чтобы люди, которые будут слушать данное интервью, понимали... Как это все произошло? То есть 24.04 утра начали бомбить сразу по нескольким направлениям Киев, это и Харьков. Дмитрий говорит, что он 100% уверен, что не Киев, Киев, но Харьков будет падать. Что произошло, что 24 симультанеально начали бомбить несколько городов по Киеву и Харьков. Все основные, не так скажем, все элитные подразделения включая десантно-штурмовые бригады, включая военный спецназ, части военно-воздушных сил, то есть это также ВДВ, то есть мы должны отличать ВДВ и ДШБ, то есть десантно-штурмовые бригады были брошены на такие города, как Николаев, Одесса, Харьков, Киев, под Киев, Васильков. Uh, all elite Russian forces were thrown into the initial wave. This includes airborne, airborne assault brigades, special forces. Uh, they were trying to take Nikolaev, Odessa, Vasilkov. И были успешно, как сказать, успешно легли на, на, на украинскую землю мертвым грузом. And they were successfully dispatched uh, uh, in Ukraine. So I, I gotta say that Russian is a very colorful language when you talk about the enemy being killed. Very, very hard to translate into English with a proper uh, emotional content. I think your journalist is doing a reasonable job. Продолжайте, пожалуйста. После этого, после сначала был обстрел, конечно, потом потом была авиация. Украинское ПВО отработало исключительно сразу же в первые четыре часа э, сбили пять, э, чтобы не быть, чтобы быть точным, или три или четыре сушки э, то истребители mm -hmm. и два вертолета за четыре часа. In the early hours after initial artillery fire, uh, there was an air assault. Uh, Ukrainian air defenses uh, performed very well. Uh, in the first hours, they took down uh, three or four uh, SU. Мы знаем примерно, какое количество всей этой техники Россия бросила на Украину. Да, конечно, это подсчитывалось. В общем, после после развала Советского Союза, в принципе, ничего в российской армии в тактическом и стратегическом отношении не поменялось. Uh, after uh, downfall of Soviet Union, nothing changed in a tactical and strategic uh, uh, aspects of Soviet military. Они это называли группировками как ну такое название как тактическая тактическая группа, тактическая оперативная группа. In Russia, they refer to it as uh, tactical group. Их насчитывалось более, сначала были цифры, коллеговались от 19, потом эта цифра возросла, возросла до 30, то есть к количеством группирования человек это было приблизительно на момент агрессии, открытой войны, это составляло приблизительно 200 тысяч человек сейчас. Uh, at the moment of invasion, there, was, uh, uh, there are various accounts, 19 to 30 tactical groups, which in total amount to 200 people on the Russian side. Да, и вот что произошло. Первый день ожесточенных боев показал, сразу же показал, что Украина не то, что не собирается сдаваться, а будет уничтожать врага на своей территории, защищая свою землю, своих семей. И после этого Россия ничего не нашла лучшего, как пустить вход контра... срочников ребятам, которым по 18, по 19 лет. In the first day of heavy fighting, it became clear that uh, Ukrainian defense is not collapsing, and Russia had to throw in additional conscript forces. 
Okay, uh, period of buckling a minute. So for for the American audience, we are all used to the U.S. Army, which is generally a very professional army, and especially after we've been you know at war for a couple of decades, uh, everybody is there because they enlisted. In Russia, it's not quite the case. There is some comparatively small number of fairly professional troops. And then there is a conscription, right? Everybody has to serve in the army for a couple of years. And the combat efficiency of the conscripts is not the same as that of the, uh, uh, of the professional uh, uh, parts uh, of the military, if you wish. Is that accurate? Yeah. yeah good. There is somebody's. Uh, there, I hear some uh, background noise. Something is happening. Is there TV or anything on anywhere? Uh, yes, I'm sorry, guys. Uh, okay, it's my bad. Hold on. Okay. okay uh, something I don't remember was uh, that was translated. Dmitry earlier said that he was involved in the fighting in 2014, 2015. In uh, Eastern Ukraine, and that's how he ended up in the he ended up in the wheelchair. So, sorry about that. That's perfectly fine. No problem. So, so uh, Russia has to bring in their conscripts, which are not exactly highly trained. Okay. That's I think where we stopped. Yes. So, what's what? So, what's what's next? Are they still? What is their objective now? It's been three or four days. Uh, Putin is now threatening everybody with nuclear weapons. So where are we now? Is it stalemate or what? Что там происходит сейчас? Русские завязли. Явно завязли. Они завязли, они завязли. Так мало того, мотивация, мотивация украинского народа настолько велика и настолько Потому что в состоянии войны страна находится 8 лет, уже 9 десяток, uh -huh. 9, 9 год уже uh -huh. в состоянии войны. Это люди, ну, вся российская армия на данный момент она настолько деморализована, что сейчас вот буквально приводили один из, из цифр, приводили статистику, что... Каждый час погибает 48 э, солдат Российской Федерации. На данный момент официальные цифры э, 4,5 тысячи за 4 дня, неофициальные порядка 10 тысяч. Около 10 тысяч за 4 дня. По неофициальным данным. Uh, at this point, uh, morale of uh, Ukrainian military is very high. Uh, they've been fighting for several years, so they were well prepared. On the Russian side, it's extremely low. Uh, they failed to achieve objectives. Uh, statistics right now is they're dying at the rate of about 48 soldiers an hour. And official statistics says that uh, 4,500 Russians uh, died during the conflict. Uh, unofficial one puts number higher at around 10,000. Those are significant, uh, significant numbers. What are the losses on the Ukrainian side? No, I don't want to... Okay. Uh... Конечно, война это война, и у нас потери, как и с, со стороны э, армии Украины, и также со стороны гражданского населения. Поскольку ракеты летят в непонятном направлении, в хаотично, идет бомбардировка в хаотичном порядке, то есть э, э, рушится инфраструктура. То есть, э, да, у нас около военных где-то насчитывается около 200 человек. Okay. Uh, war is war, and there are casualties both among military and among civilians on the Ukrainian side. There's a lot of infrastructure being destroyed, uh, and right now uh, putting military casualties at around 200 on the Ukrainian side. Okay, uh, that's a that's a, that's a stark uh, that's a stark difference between losses of uh, course. on the two sides. На данный момент президент Зеленский обратился к, ко всем международным лидерам с поддержкой и с предложением, что любой доброволец, который изъявил желание принимать участие в освобождении Украины, потому что весь цивилизованный мир прекрасно понимает, что это война не, с Россией, не России с Украиной, это война России со всем цивилизованным миром. И это все осознают. И сейчас, мало того, еще и Белоруссия подключается. А это уже официально? Is it official? А, ну, ну, он, ну, только, только что вот, Лукашенко объявил, что если вы хотите с нами, если а, вы хотите да, переговоры, то сначала вы, с, с, украинская армия должна сложить оружие. So, uh, 
Uh, so everybody understands this is not just a conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, at this point, it's almost official that Belarus is uh, taking part in the conflict. And uh, Lukashenko, the president of uh, Belarus, said that if anybody wants to negotiate with Belarus, Ukraine needs to lay down its arms first. So President Zelensky announced that anybody who wants to fight on the side of Ukraine. И сейчас первые, кто отозвались, это чеченцы, которые настоящие чеченцы, не кадыровцы, которые находятся сейчас в Европе. Там очень большая комьюнити, у них порядка 200 тысяч человек, из них принимавших участие в боях около 30, от 30 до 50 тысяч человек. То есть они изъявили желание и своим опытом. Мы с ними, кстати, это называется у них пол, пол Дудаева, вот, это, конечно, профессиональные ребята, профессиональные бойцы, я не знаю, что такое Россия, и за это только кадырцы. The first people who volunteered were Chechens, uh, who in exile in Europe, uh, there is about uh, uh, 100 тысяч, ты сказал, чеченцев в Европе? Uh, у них диаспора насчитывает в Европе около 200 тысяч. Okay, there is about 200,000 Chechens in diaspora in Europe. Uh, out of them, 30 to 50,000 have taken part in uh, uh, combat against Russians in both Chechen wars. Uh, there is already a Chechen regiment in Ukraine uh, named uh, after the Diet. And uh, uh, Dmitry says that uh, they're very professional, very experienced fighters. And he worked with them before. Вот, вот на данный момент вот такая ситуация. На данный момент вот сейчас обратно вот мы с Харьковым Сестра прислала сообщение, что объявили опять воздушную тревогу и ложатся снаряды. Такое впечатление, что возле нашего дома. Ну, ну вот так. Uh, he mentioned that at this point his sister is writing that uh, they have another uh, aerial um, siren go off, and it seems like shells are landing near their house. Right, period uh, buckle in a minute. So guys, generally, I see all the comments, and as a little bit later on, uh, we will go through and address the pertinent ones. I did pull one up. Where do we send money to uh, support Ukraine? Uh, do, you, do you know of any charities that you know of? Да, any знаю, организations я... deliver money to Ukraine? That uh, you can share да, with me? Dima, у нас есть private chat. На экране справа okay. есть private chat. Там напечатай, я это выброшу на экран. Сейчас. So he'll put it in the private chat, and I'm gonna put it up on the screen where you can uh, uh, take part in donating to the defense of Ukraine. Ребята, я не знаю, как это вы, вы выбросить на экран. Я даже не не представляю. А, пришли фотографии мне пожалуйста. Сейчас. Сейчас. Uh, we'll get it up. So in the meantime, this is actually an interesting statement from Jared, that he expects that U.S. special forces are involved in a covert capacity, which likely accounts for some Russian casualties. I really don't know. Given who we have in the White House, I can't. I have no clue. Uh, there is I no, wish it was the case. I think there is very, very, very small chances it's true. I do believe, in fact, I know that there are some former special forces on the ground, but they are participating as private citizens. I don't Correct. Know that, yes. Uh, but I don't. Thanks to our dipstick president, I don't think uh, anybody's going to go there in, a, in, in an official capacity. Okay. Okay. Пока Женя там разбирается. Okay. Вопрос следующий. В новостях было написано, что более около трех тысяч русских солдат были попали в плен. В этом есть какая-нибудь правда? Да, почему, почему нет? Они стоят по Черниговым, и сейчас решается вопрос о сдаче, вернее, не сдаче, а сдаче в плен целой бригады, целой бригады мотострелковой. А бригада – это сколько человек? Ну, по военному времени это порядка трех тысяч человек. Okay. So, uh, Dimitri tells us that uh, it is true, near Chernigov, the entire uh, motorized brigade was captured, which is right around 3,000 people, and they are, uh, the issue what to do with them is actually being resolved uh, right now, sort of in real time. 
Вчера, кстати, на уличных боях Харькова был уничтожен элитный спецназ, группа развед, развед роты российского элитного спецназа. Ясный Белл в Харькове был уничтожен. Какой размер юнита? А, ну, там сейчас, сейчас подсчитываются, потому что там были взрывы. Там только осталось, насколько я знаю, около пяти человек живых. Okay. Это, uh, это, если, если там за что, там порядка 50, там 60, ну, вот в таком okay. порядке, то есть. Uh, elite unit of Russian Spetsnaz uh, was destroyed out of uh, probably 50 or so people in a team only six uh, were able to escape. Okay. Okay, so um, to donate to Ukraine, I'm going to put a QR code on the screen. And uh, if you guys are so inclined, you can. Okay. No. There we go. So if you want to donate to help Ukraine, here's a QR code that we got from Dimitri. Um. I'm gonna keep it up on the screen for a little bit, Дима, продолжайте, я пока этот QR-код здесь я подержу буду. немножко, а потом я его уберу. И на данный момент сейчас Украина получила беспрецедентную поддержку со всех стран. Лично мое мнение, Европа и весь мир цивилизованный наконец-то открыли глаза и поняли, кто такой Путин и что представляет собой Российская Федерация на данный момент. Uh, at this point, uh, Ukraine got unprecedented help. Uh, both the United States and Europe opened their eyes and they understand Putin for what he is. И то, что весь мир и все, кто начиная с Германии, заканчивая Францией, нам рассказывали и все, да, мы вас поддерживаем, все, понимаете, там тоже армия одна из самых больших армий. Ну что, сейчас эта самая большая армия одна из самых больших армий, так скажем, терпит поражение прямо тут. Мы свидетели этому всему на данный момент. Uh, all of the countries in Europe that were hesitant, saying it's uh, one of the largest armies, uh, what can we do? At this point, they see them uh, struggling and being defeated. And и, and... И... Yeah, да. и на данный момент, вот что мы имеем. Путин начинает угрожать ядерным оружием. And now Putin is threatening with uh, nuclear weapons. Well, I, I don't know how, what else he has left in his arsenal, honestly, other than threats. Uh, Dima, вопрос. Question. The ghost of Kiev. Any details? Вы знакомы с этим выражением? Да, конечно. Замечательно. Да, конечно. Это, это наша гордость. Это наш герой. И, к сожалению, я сейчас не могу найти это видео. Мне кто-то скинул его с Киева, с, 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 с окраин Киева. И mm -hmm. где, за, где был запечатлен один из его боев, и когда он положил э, один из российских самолетов. Если потом найдешь, сбрось мне это видео, я его, я его выброшу на канал. Попробую найти. Это очень, прошу прощения, это очень сложно, поскольку у меня действительно телефон переполнен. Mm -hmm. Ну, я постараюсь, окей? Okay? Я постараюсь. Если найдешь. Если не я найдешь, постараюсь. то это окей. Okay. Я постараюсь. Uh, so, so... Uh, for, for those who do not know, uh, Ghost of Kiev is a nickname of Ukrainian pilot who distinguished himself uh, uh, by fighting successfully against multiple uh, Russian fighter planes over the skies of Kiev. At this point, the tally is around seven uh, planes that he successfully downed. This is quite remarkable. So is there uh, dog fighting happening in the skies above Kiev? Uh, uh, dog fighting uh, so the, you, Eugene and I are running into <laughs> translation issues because we don't know the right terminology in, in one of the languages. Yeah. Uh, uh, Классический догфайтинг или это что-то другое? Это обыкновенный, как все прекрасно понимают, это, это реальный воздушный бой. Это реальный yeah. воздушный бой. Это классический air-to-air combat. Вау, wow. remarkable. Окей. Okay. Окей, okay, so, uh, real quick. 
just adding from myself, uh, it seems like initial plan was for Russia to drop a very sizable, supposedly 10,000 strong uh, airborne uh, unit near Kiev. Uh, and as far as I understand, the plane got scrapped mainly because they weren't able to completely overwhelm uh, uh, Ukrainian air defenses. Right. Uh, Дима, мне казалось, там собирались перебрасывать больше десантников, но после того, как там сбили пару самолетов, это сбили, сбор... сбили два Ил-76, на борту которых находилось более 200 человек. Это, на, это, это нам наш украинский ответ на то, что они сделали под Луганским аэропортом, когда, когда э, сбили наших десантников. Okay. Uh, there are two Il-76 uh, that were uh, shot down by, by Ukrainian air defense, uh, carrying over 200 airborne troops on board. And uh, Ukrainians view it as an answer to uh, Russia shooting down one of Ukrainian planes with airborne troops uh, early in 2014. Okay. All right, uh, real quick. So, Drew, yeah, if you are struggling with the QR code, uh, yeah, I can donate on your behalf. You, you know where to find me. So uh, another question from Chen. So Chen believes that the Russian elite military units aren't involved in case of NATO. Uh, no, I don't think that's the case. N the best I can tell, elite units are involved. They're just not doing very well. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can ask, we can ask Dmitry, but there is no chance that Russian elite units are not involved because I think this mm -hmm. was the key to the whole campaign. Okay. In fact, then, uh, I, I don't know if Dmitry, you know, but uh, I heard in the news that uh, Russian Alpha Special Interior uh, Unit was in Kiev even before the conflict, uh, trying to kind of lay the ground for the fast progression of Russian forces. Я слышал отряд Альфа был рядом с Киевом еще до начала войны. Так, они они до начала войны около трех-четырех месяцев. Они запускали туда диверсионную группу, они снимали квартиры, они там жили в Днепропетровске, в Харькове, в Киеве. Но на данный момент, когда весь народ сплотился, то вы же понимаете, люди, которые живут на одном районе, они все друг друга знают. И все территориальные обороны, они знают в лицо друг друга. Это как считайте, как семья. И теперь представляете, сейчас какие-то люди, группировка ну, там, от трех до пяти, например, да, человек, выходят с оружием, и они знают, кто это такие, но они их уничтожают. So, 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 so. Let me elaborate a little bit to explain the situation to American part of the uh, uh -huh. audience. So uh, uh, there's there are a lot of Russians obviously who live in Ukraine, so it's not very difficult for somebody who is Russian speaking to blend in. As a result, Russia was able to uh, send special forces three, four months before the invasion, and they rented apartments, basically they live there. Uh, uh, paving the way for the, the, the occupation force. Uh, and what Mitri says is obviously people know each other. And when when they kind of finally decided to form units and come out armed, etc., they were very quickly found out and destroyed. So overall, we didn't see this as a kind of successful technique, despite the fact that they were very well integrated for a very long time. It's very, very interesting. И плюс еще идентификация врага идет просто-напросто по, по, по языковому барьеру, да, то есть э, наша украинская, украинская мова, она отличает, кардинально отличается от русского языка, и поэтому на простые вопросы русский не может ответить просто, ну, просто невозможно, это нереально. And uh, obviously there are linguistic differences. So people who speak Ukrainian, even in Russian, that's a slightly different pronunciation. So even asking simple questions, you can always uh, find out if somebody is uh, native or not. То есть русские, русские говорящих по, на украинском достаточно хорошо мало. Все русскоговорящие, которые говорящие, живущие в Украине, mm -hmm. все исключительно знают украинский язык. Okay. Все. Okay. Uh, in Ukraine, everybody who is Russian speaking, they also bilingual, they also speak Russian. You speak Ukrainian, okay. Okay, got it. Okay, interesting. All right. И что дальше? So what's next? I mean... Победа. Дальше победа. Разгром, <laughs> разгром противника и победа. Хочу, пользуясь случаем, воспользоваться, раз такая уже возможность возникла, а, хочу обратиться ко всем военнослужащим Российской Федерации единственный шанс попасть вам домой живым, 
это сдаться нам в плен. Сложить оружие и сдаться в плен. Другого шанса у вас домой живым вернуться нет. Ребята, вы в аду. Uh, so uh, Dmitry says that uh, next is victory, and using the opportunity, he wanted to urge Russian forces to uh, turn themselves in, lay down their arms. This is their only chance to come home alive. That's a strong statement. И как долго все это продлится? Все зависит от того, что что в голове у Путина. Это раз, потому что реально состояние психологическое этого человека предугадать его дальнейший шаг, конечно, невозможно, но он все равно будет давить на то, что у нас завершение, так сказать, как он сказал, военной операции захватить Киев и либо либо на данный момент Харьков. Ну, скорее всего, он будет давить Киев. How long this operation is going to last depends on one person, uh, Putin, and what's in his head. Uh, for Putin, completion of this operation uh, initially was uh, capture of Kyiv. Uh, at this point, it's very least uh, taking over Kharkov. Uh, but uh, ultimately, everything uh, depends on him. Я думаю, я верю, я верю, что это продлится недолго, потому что завтра понедельник и завтра Россия проснется уже в другой стране, люди уже проснутся в другой стране, поскольку все банковские операции будут ну, не, не, не работать ни один из банков, люди не смогут снимать деньги с карточек, людей не будет налички. Все очень просто, страна будет рушиться на наших глазах изнутри, мы будем свидетелями Uh, Dmitry says that uh, uh, very soon Russia will wake up and the Russians will wake up in the different countries. Their credit cards are not going to work, banking system is going to crumble, and the country is going to crumble from within. So it doesn't think it can last very long. Другой вопрос, который должен, в принципе, нас всех волновать и как бы настораживать. Насколько далеко он может, может пойти? Не настолько далеко вглубь страны, а насколько далеко? Сколько понадобится им еще? положить жизни людей, в том числе своих, как как все видят, то есть и Украины, сколько, ну, где где предел, где предел его маразма? Another question that all of us should worry about is uh, what's a limiting line for Putin? How many more people he wants to uh, die? Uh, how far is he willing to go? That's actually that. Is, so that is really an interesting question. I was looking into this and now. I realized I don't remember how old Putin is. And then I realized that this year he's going to be 70. Is this just his final attempt to go on history as one of Russia's great leaders and is failing with that? His back is to the wall. What's he's going to, what is he going to do next? Как он объявил, он же себя позиционирует как человека, собирая, ну, Хотел сказать, сборщик земель русских. Он хочет возобновить обратно Советский Союз, но да. а, без шансов. Просто без шансов. As he announced, he wants to uh, Putin. As Putin announced, he wants to reconstitute Soviet Union, uh, but uh, kind of there is no chance. Uh, as Mitro says, and definitely the way uh, the campaign is going, it doesn't look promising. Yeah, that is uh, that is very accurate. I don't think any of the other former Soviet republics are itching to rejoin Russia. Except for Belarus, which may. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. Belarus already sort of joined, so Putin owns yeah. Belarus. But um, все остальные бывшие советские республики, они, скажем так, энтузиазмом не брыжут. Ну, энтузиазмом брыжут, не брыжут, но потом, ну, у них есть там свои какие военные союзы такие как ОТГБ, там, то есть это страны бывшего Советского Союза, которые при какой-либо внутренней угрозе могут предоставить помощь в виде военной, военной силы. А какие это страны? Казахстан, Туркменистан, Белоруссия, Армения, угу. Таджикистан. Okay. То есть... Ну вот они обратились к Казахстану, вот они позавчера, Россия обратилась к Казахстану, Казахстана, Казахстан понимает, какие будут последствия, и поэтому ответил категорически нет. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, so so uh, there is very slim chance of reconstituting Soviet Union, but there is defensive alliance among several of the uh, states, uh, which were part of the former Soviet Union, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, uh, Armenia, and a few more. Uh, and uh, Putin uh, notably asked Kazakhstan for assistance. And they, so they out, yeah, and they straight out rejected it because they kind of understood what's at stake and how campaign is going. Okay. То есть, короче, куча станов, и там где-то армия, они сидят и пытаются сообразить, во что, они, во что их втянули. Да. Okay. Хорошо, вопрос. Цивилизованные люди в Швейцарии и в Америке не могут понять, каким образом Путин пытается завоевать страну, а интернет работает, электричество есть, вода есть. У них просто не получилось все это подавить или что? Так у него... Вы же понимаете, у него стояла цель Блицкрик. Блицкрик по, 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 по военных операциях по захвату какой-либо локальной территории, либо определенного участка территории составляет от 1 до 3, максимум 4. Он даже не, у него даже в целях не было подавить что-либо, потому что он знал, что, мы, что украинцы складут оружие и ну, пусть будут его там с цветами встречать или там. А то есть, то есть ты верил, задач... что он туда идет освободителем? Конечно, они же они всему миру с Лукашенко кричали, что мы, если надо, до Киева зайдем до три дня. Ну, и где? Путин's campaign was uh, based on a blitzkrieg model. He was not looking for war of attrition, long ground campaign. So expectation was this is three, four days. Everyone will lay down their arms and this is going to be a kind of short, victorious war. Uh, so to, to answer the question about kind of power grid, etc., this was not part of the plan because assumption was campaign would be too quick to worry about attrition. That is a very salient point. Okay. Ну что ж. И что из всего этого получится? Это конец режима Путина? Да. Скажем. Это после это я с большей уверенностью могу сказать, что это последняя война в истории Российской Федерации. Дмитрий uh, says yes, most likely it's the end of Putin's regime and it's the last war uh, in the history of Russian Federation. В Украине, uh, понимаете, это... в Украине, в Украине заложено в Конституции мы, uh, европейский вектор. Мы выбрали ос осознанно свой выбор. Для Российской империи, потому что в том, в том виде, которое сейчас выглядит Россия, да, и те страны, которые ну, в какой в какой мере от нее зависят, это будем называть та, та же самая Российская империя, да, и она не может существовать без Украины, вот так вот. Но, если не доведи Господь, а такого не случится, на что, на что, он, на что он рассчитывал. О, кстати, одну секундочку, 27 самолетов, 26 вертолетов, 147 танков, 706 БМП, в общем, это сумасшедшие цифры. Градов, тут 4, то стоит, наверное, автомобильной техники 60, бронеколесной. В общем, ребята, тут... я бы хотел бы вам сейчас показать, это просто ужас. Подожди, давай я переведу один под ноги. Скажи, сколько ты чего? Самолетов 20, 27 самолетов, 26 вертолетов. Uh, 27 planes uh, were down by Ukrainian forces, 26 helicopters. Uh, больше, больше 400, больше 400 uh, легко, как, как сказать, БМ, БТР и БМП. Uh, uh, more than 400 armored uh, troop transport. 147 танков. 147 tanks. Ну и проживаю в силу противника официальные цифры 4,5 тысячи убитыми. An official number for uh, number of Russians killed uh, 4,500. So in terms of the equipment, that's very, very significant for the army the size of Russia. That's a lot. Она даже такие потери не несла, когда когда вела операции такие же самые операции по захвату чеченской ну чеченской Чечни. Ну война война с Чечней была война партизанская в большой степени. Но они несли там сумасшедшие тоже да, потери. Они... Как... Сумасшедшие человеческие потери. Ну да. но такой техники мне противостояла. Yeah. Украина э, Украина это не очень большая страна, да, это все-таки серьезная страна, это, это не Чечня. Uh, so these numbers exceed numbers in Chechen war, and uh, Ilya added that this was kind of more of a guerrilla war, and may, may not rely on uh, armored vehicles quite as much, but uh, Ukraine is a much larger country as well. It's uh, like uh, we um, in the U.S., right? So half of the Americans I know don't know where Ukraine is on the map, right? Um, 
and don't take that as a criticism, take it as an observation. Ukraine is is a serious country. Ukraine is uh, what roughly the size of Texas, but yeah. population the size of California, roughly. I think that's about 40 million people. 40 million people. So, the народу примерно как в Калифорнии, а по территории примерно как штат Техас. Ну, чтобы понимали, чтобы чтобы вы понимали, где начинается Нью-Джерси и начинается штат Иллинойс. Да. Это только, ну, вот такие вот масштабы. So the so the east to west Ukraine is roughly like from New Jersey to Illinois, something like that. So it's 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 a, it's a, it's a substantial country. It's not like trying to, you know, suppress some tin pot dictator in Syria or going against uh, the guerrilla warfare in Chechnya. Да, хочу хочу ещё раз акцентировать ваше внимание на то, что сама ставка на то, что Путин захватит столицу Украины, это было то, что подавление народа и, ну, то есть несопоставимость, несопоставимость вооружённых сил России и Украины, что мы сдадим оружие и Украина пойдёт. Но этого не случится и не случилось и не случится никогда. So the whole bet of the campaign was that there is such asymmetry in forces that Ukraine will just lay down their arms. But uh, we see it's not happening and it's not going to happen. Yeah, something uh, Dmitry said earlier that Lukashenko and Putin were uh, yelling to everybody who would hear that Kiev would fall within, was it, three days, I think? Yeah, I don't I think I think that estimate was wrong. I think they, over, they overestimated how quickly they can do this. Uh, for me, the most interesting part that this is uh, intelligence failure, as kind of we started from the point, Ukraine is not like uh, North Korea or Syria, where it's very difficult to send American forces to do reconnaissance. Uh, Ukraine is an open country. Anybody can drive in, talk to people, look around, so you could be as prepared as you want to be. And the fact that they were calculated so badly is uh, kind of quite shocking, militarily speaking. So that's actually that's a, that's a probably a good question for Dmitry. Why there was such a failure with intelligence? Почему почему они так пролетели с разведкой? Потому что как бы Украина открытая страна. Можно прислать сколько людей ты хочешь поговорить с кем хочешь. Это значительно легче, чем проводить наводить разведку в Ираке, например. Это обыкновенный обыкновенный просчет устаревшей системы. Uh, it's a typical miscalculation of uh, aging system. Что ты имеешь в виду под устаревшей системой? Во-первых, это их не значит так, это их вера, их вера в то, что они великие. Это первая ошибка. Вторая ошибка, что они непобедимые. Это вторая ошибка. И третья ошибка это просчёт настроения всего населения, всего народа Украины по отношению к ним. Yeah. Uh, so Dmitry was saying that uh, kind of it's a miscalculation of uh, spirit, both assuming that Russia is great and uh, undefeated, uh, and the fact that uh, Ukrainian people do not have will to fight. Uh, so is it just old style Soviet hubris that they're the greatest and nobody else can resist? Perhaps. Uh, it's, uh, it's just like a Soviet concept that they are the best that no one can stand. Yes, yes, yes. They also showed it in the demonstration that they showed it from the beginning of the war. They thought that all of them, as one soldier who is in the war, they say that all of the commanders who are with them before the start of the war, Вы туда зайдете, вас там встретят, все будет хорошо, сопротивления не будет. Мы пройдемся по Украине, как по Крыму. Yes, uh, all uh, captured POWs uh, uh, mentioned that commanders told them that this is going to be very little resistance. Uh, it's going to be a walk in the park. It's going to be very similar to Crimea. Um... Interesting. So, uh, Дима, я на этот вопрос отвечу по-английски. So, uh, how, do, how does Greenland and the UK fit into all of this? I heard something that Russia, if they took Ukraine, they were going to take those two as well, just for strategic plan against the USA, maybe. So, I don't know how what they were going to do in Greenland. There is not much there other than a mel huge melting iceberg. Uh, but uh, Russia is very far away from occupying Ukraine. There are quite a few, uh, Ukraine, excuse me, United Kingdom. There are quite a few countries between Russia and United Kingdom. 
So I'm not sure where this uh, uh, came from, but I don't think uh, I haven't heard of any uh, UK or, Green or Greenland uh, involvement into this uh, with one exception. So one of the things that happened uh, during the Trump presidency was this big hoopla about Trump refusing help to Ukraine, but then Trump did start sending javelins over. And then UK sent also a fairly large shipment of javelins. Uh, and low. And pardon me? And low. And low. Yeah, it's a different rocket. Yeah. Okay. Javelins, ну, они... Я могу ответить на этот вопрос, что это просто не, нереальная задача. Как они могут? Они вообще ничего не могут. Ну да. Yeah. Они не... Про... Они... Вот вы, вы, вы понимаете, вот сейчас, если посмотреть на карту Украины, вот там, где были бомбардировки, там, где завязывал собой, никуда никто не... не, не ну, они никуда не зашли в вглубь. То есть, да, они залетели, да, это было верломно, это было очень быстро. Но, тем не менее, они на том же месте вот и на данный момент. Вот, и на данный момент ничего не изменилось. Uh, Дмитрий saying that, uh, of course, it's impossible to talk about Ukraine or Iceland. They cannot uh, possibly dream that far. Uh, even with respect to most immediate objectives, uh, areas that they bombed and they were softened, uh, they entered those areas and they still in those areas. Nothing moved in four days. Yeah, that, that's sort of what I started with. So uh, Kiev, the capital, as you guys see my mouse is here. Kharkov, where Dmitry's family is from, is here. Kharkov no, is... no, 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 it's the east side. No, oh, what Kharkov? No, what is Chernigov? Yeah. Oh, Chernigov is here. My mm -hmm. sister-in-law is from there. Uh, Kharkov is, is here. So what's happening here near Crimea? Херсон, Мелитопль, что там происходит? Там идут, там идут, там реально идут ожесточенные бои. Кстати, вчера... На подлете в, в Николаев также был сбит российский десант. Окей, okay. Николаев это где-то рядом с Одессой, кажется, да? А вот Одесса и Николаев чуть-чуть вот вы, выше будет. Ну, они здесь? рядышком, в общем, да. Okay. Uh, so there is heavy fighting near Crimea uh, and uh, uh, Nikolaev, which is one of the uh, strategic uh, locations. Where the yeah, where Ilya's mouse is. Uh, there was another uh, plane downed uh, there yesterday. И плюс такой, такой сплоченности украинского народа мы не видели, я думаю, наверное, с 2014 года, когда э, бежал у нас президент Янукович. Which is which is kind of interesting because uh, that by Putin was that uh, Russian native Ukrainian divide is gonna faster as part of the invasion. The opposite happened. Basically, divisions kind of disappeared because that's my understanding. That means that в результате нападения все внутриполитические разделения между Украиной пропали. Все, пропали. Мы сейчас сначала с русскими закончим, потом будем дальше продолжать со своими разбираться. Но дело в том, что вот какая ситуация. В Крыму вот объявили, что оккупационные власти Крыма собирают мужчин молодого до 60 лет на призыв в армию и отправку в Украину. Вот сейчас. Вот новость пошла. In the Crimea, right? Yeah. So that's, I mean, for background, once again, if Russia is looking for more conscripts, that's bad news. They're running out of people to fight. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I think that conscripts from Crimea, it's more of a psychological thing because Ukraine views them as Ukrainians. Uh, it's not that they necessarily are running out of conscripts. So, so what is the psychological advantage of getting people from uh, Crimea? Uh, essentially human shield, I guess. Okay. All right. Well, that's interesting. Um, Eugene, I haven't heard anything about this. I saw before the invasion began, Russians were supposed to trading fuel for food. What if the trade will are? Uh, that's news. I'm not sure what that is. Russia is a country or what we're we talking about? Uh, I don't fully understand. Can you Russia... clarify if you don't mind? Uh, ну, смотрите, по поводу еды, еды топлива, в общем, там есть Значит, две новости, одна из которых, а, те, вы же понимаете, когда подразделение идет, оно идет, например, частями, они не идут, как, как не знаю, 
все это должны как бы понимать, то э, люди, которые остались и ждут в своей очереди на отправку на подкрепление, они видят, что ответа нету никакого, то есть от своих нет ответа. Никто им не, э, никто не отвечает, никто не докладывает обстановку, то есть люди там гибнут, а этих отправляют пачками. Так что они начали делать? Они начали сливать топливо в танках, для, дабы не идти в Украину. А буквально вчера 5000 военнослужащих в Белгороде отказались идти э, на войну контрактники. Это, кстати, контрактники, которые из элитной там, подразделений Российской Федерации. Uh, yeah, so what uh, kind of troops do, because typically they're detached as units, and if you do not hear from previous unit, the safe assumption is that something is wrong. Uh, so as a result, a lot of units drain their fuel to give themselves a good pretext not to advance. Uh, and yesterday in Belgrade, which is a huge staging ground for Russian troops before going to Ukraine, Uh, 5,000 uh, uh, professional uh, soldiers refused to enter, which is, again, we're talking about professionals, not the conscripts. А те, которые сейчас в подразделении стоят uh, недалеко да, от каких-то небольших поселков, они бегают сейчас с просьбой, чтобы мирные жители их накормили. And the units are stationed near uh, small settlements. They uh, ask civilians for food. Uh, presumably because supply lines are non-existent and kind of easily interrupted. Okay. Right, so there's an interesting question here. Uh, from the videos, the, the Russian equipment looks to be old, from 1670s. Is, could this be a stress test? I mean, it doesn't look like a stress test, but what do you think? Ник спрашивает, оборудование выглядит, русское оборудование выглядит старым 60-х, 70-х годов. Может Ребят, быть... да, 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 да. Ребята, это настолько правда, что, послушайте, то, что все показывается на телевидении и на их военных парадах, это максимум то, что они могут показать. Да, у них там есть комплексы такие, как там, кто у них там, я даже... То, не, калибр. Потом у них есть Искандеры. Так вы, что вы понимали, их такое ограниченное количество, что по, по нескольким сводкам говорят, что у них осталось не более 24 ракет всего. Yeah, just so you're not confused, things you see during parades are for parade purposes and exist in parade quantities. So a lot of equipment is indeed old and kind of there are newer type of equipment such as Escandar, new rockets. Uh, we're talking about uh, Russia having maybe a couple dozen of those. Uh, by the way, I, I don't find it generally super strange because even kind of when we're entering Iraq, we had Uh, AAVs, uh, and AAV is by no means uh, super new equipment. It was in good shape and engines get replaced, but in general, you don't expect that equipment has kind of last five years of manufacturing that it takes very long time to modernize military. So just for my day job, um, I do uh, some support stuff for various guidance systems for missiles. Uh, we do renovations and support things for missiles that were designed in the 50s and 60s still. Uh, and the most U.S. military mostly doesn't use them, but a lot of allied nations do, and they still get calibrated and supported. And uh, you know, I can't tell you which countries use them, but you'd be surprised about how many and how modern uh, many of these countries are. Yep. Uh, okay. Oh, that's an interesting question. So isn't that odd whether there is no video or picture evidence? of downed aircraft uh I, i've seen them i don't know i guess you need to look around uh Dmitry, there is a photography uh, uh just while he's looking uh, i mean i was looking at several videos of Uh, completely demolished columns of armor, clearly in different locations, etc. So, к сожалению, uh, это у меня есть у меня есть это видео uh, ночного. Ну да, это нереально просто показать. А uh, это это линк ты мне можешь прислать? Это мне выслали на Facebook, но меня кто-то заблокировал и поэтому я не могу вам отправить okay. это видео. Okay. Это воздушный бой, кстати, над моим домом, там где одна система противовоздушной обороны обманула выстрелом в вражеский самолет и на подлете, когда поворачивал вражеский самолет, наш самолет его сбил, ну полностью разорвал. Это, кстати, над нашим домом был. Uh, so Mitro is saying that he has a video of uh, uh, aerial fight literally happening over his uh, house in Ukraine. 
uh, and uh, air defense system uh, fire the valley to throw off Russian plane uh, to uh, get it into the aerial trap by another uh, Ukrainian fighter. So basically the answer is like, no, those videos exist. Obviously it's combat, so you cannot really uh, send a lot of journalists to every location where this takes place, but I definitely have seen enough that I have no doubt that there are significant losses. We may not be able to account for every vehicle. Okay, that's uh, uh, that's fair. I haven't done super extensive searches for pictorial evidence. I spent a lot of time reading through um, stories from people on the ground and somewhat analytical pieces of people trying to figure out uh, uh, what's next. Because what Russia planned clearly did not happen. So the big, really big, big question is what's next? And what's next is not simple. Are we looking at Putin losing power? Are we looking at what? What's going to happen with Donetsk and Lugansk, right? So that were tried to break away, what is in 2014. If Russia loses this war, which is increasingly looking likely, what's going to happen there? Вот эту всю Луганскую, Луганскую область, Донецкую область, все же понимали, все говорили, все об этом, не знаю, только ленивый, наверное, не рассказывал то, что и доказывал, объяснял, что это будет использоваться против Украины. Эти люди были обмануты. Эти люди сейчас были, кстати, где сейчас бои идут, ожесточенные возле счастья Луганской области. Там первую, кинули первых, это местных жителей. То есть переодели их форму, ну, дали оружие, естественно. Они там все, все думают, что Россия им поможет. Ну, вот и все. Это сепаратисты, которые вот... Дмитрий uh, says that it, it was understood that Lugansk and Donetsk from the very beginning is going to be used as pretext. And in fact, what happened in the very early uh, hours of this uh, uh, latest engagement that uh, uh, locals from Lugansk were uh, conscripted and sent as a first wave. Uh, they were assuming that Russia will help, uh, etc., but uh, they were kind of ultimately completely unprepared on training. Very interesting. Sorry, guys, I have to, I have to go. Uh, okay. Dima, I have to answer to my, to my sister. Окей, okay, спасибо огромное. Удачи вам, и будем надеяться, что ваша семья через все это пройдет. Слава Украине! Она, моя семья уже много чего прошла, потому что я был на войне, получил тяжелое ранение. Я потерял своего двоюродного брата, потерял... Достаточно наша семья этого все увидела, и, и, и плюс еще и, и у меня жена, которая тоже это все видела на свои глаза. Так что нам не привыкать, в принципе, то, что есть война, есть война, и победа будет за Украиной. Слава Украине. Спасибо, Слава Спасибо Украине. огромное. Спасибо. Спасибо. Всего доброго, ребят. Спасибо. All right. So that was really interesting. Uh, Eugene, thank you. So, uh, Dmitry, Eugene knows him, so he uh, uh, convinced him to come and join us for a few minutes. Uh, I apologize about all the Russian, but he's in America for not too long. So we need to do a little bit of help. And uh, so now, you, when Eugene and I here, I don't know how much time you have, Eugene. Uh, let's look at a few comments and answer a few questions that I kind of glossed over since I wanted to let uh, Dimitri talk. Yep. And uh, let me see. I'm just kind of. Well, that's an interesting uh, question from a very American perspective. So, uh, Jared, who I think, Eugene, you remember Jared, right? So, we, we mm -hmm. met him at Chacho. Show. Mm -hmm. Do you think the Ukrainian government handing out AKs indiscriminately to its civilians terrifies fellow European countries or may make them rethink gun control? Honestly, I think it's the last thing in anybody's mind. They are so terrified of Putin at this stage that the Ukrainians with AKs are, are not, not too worrisome for them, I think. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I don't think anybody thinking about gun controls in relationship to that. I got a different question yesterday from somebody if they are actually kind of how viable they are as a defense, as opposed to presenting more risk to themselves and others. And I, like, obviously it's a mixed bag, but overall it's not too difficult to be effective in a guerrilla fighting in an urban environment. And in fact, uh, based on my experience from Iraq, you can do a lot of damage by just harassing fire, not necessarily super precise uh, fire. It buttons up troops, makes them spend hours chasing some random sniper that in reality just some teenager with a gun. So, in, in, in other words, I think uh, 
the consensus from this libertarian contingent here is let's arm everyone and let the chips fall where they may. Well, obviously, coming from American perspective, I'm not sh uh, you know, terrified of uh, civilians with a gun. <laughs> no, not terribly, no. Okay, this is a very good comment. Uh, two things that Russian fate terribly. Command and control still effective. Air superiority for Russians not established. Yeah, the air superiority part for me was stunning. I uh, thought better of the Russian Air Force. The overall, the failures of planning here, like that's one of the reasons why I originally I wanted to just bring Eugene into this because I'm not a military guy, right? I'm a techie guy. Uh, um, yeah, this looks so weird. This looks so 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 weird. It's it's just amazing. I, I think the plan was uh, so. So what uh, kind of we discussed with Zilli before that uh, kind of uh, plan hinged on this blitzkrieg campaign was a lot of use of special forces, which hundred percent relies on complete air superiority. And the fact that this this piece four days in is nowhere near being fully established, and they did not uh, have this contingency. Uh, it's mind-boggling. This is kind of colossal yeah. failure in planning. I I couldn't freaking believe it. It was just 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 ridiculous. Yeah. Maybe so. Everybody thinks of United States as the paper tiger, and in some ways we are, especially with who's in power now. But maybe Russia is the paper tiger, and this Ukrainian campaign is exposing that. Yeah. I think Russia has very kind of good quality special forces for unconventional warfare. Uh, they that's what they've trained for for a long time, and I have no reason to assume that kind of overall they're incompetent. Uh, but when it comes to this large scale operation, uh, I actually kind of when was the last time that they've done this successfully? Georgia was a little bit of a failure in 2008, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of miscommunication. Their kind of calm equipment wasn't working, they didn't know how to coordinate fire, a lot of friendly fire casualties. Uh, and after that, they said that it's all got sorted out now, it's a different military, etc. And, uh, but they never actually proved it. There was never a conflict where they demonstrated this. And now this is a major conflict with a lot of coordination. Uh, maybe communication is not a problem, but something definitely is. So, but I mean, stepping back from this a little bit, right? So the world generally has been involved in asymmetrical warfare for 20 years, right? No one really is very good right now, arguably, in major power conflicts. And Ukraine is not as major of a power as you know, China, but it is a, still a significant power. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I would say that the U.S. actually experienced some kind of resemblance of uh, uh, conventional warfare in the fir uh, first couple of weeks in Iraq. Obviously mm -hmm. not as determined as what we're seeing in Ukraine right now, but we had artillery fire directed against us. We had tanks uh, opposing us, etc. Uh, so, uh, again, like, but one thing that the United States had, no questions about it, complete air superiority. Uh, and that made all of those assets kind of borderline irrelevant. Well, I mean, to, to be fair, like looking at the various failures that U.S. had in different wars that we've been involved in, they're seldom tactical, right? There have been strategic failures coming out of mm -hmm. sort of, but but I can think of very very few tactical failures on the on the part of uh, U.S. military, right? But anyhow, that's not what this is about. So. Uh, Brooks Precision. A short while ago, they were reporting a three-mile column of Russian tanks heading toward Kiev, 40 miles out. Yeah, I saw that, and then I don't hear anything, so we'll see. I have a, If they don't have air superiority, and if there is enough uh, uh, javelins and whatever was the other missile you guys were talking about, out there, a three-mile column of tanks is, may not do that much. Yeah, I, I guess like I, I never think of javelin as a strategic weapon. Because the United States typically takes care of hard targets using planes and helicopters. Me uh, but it very much is. Yeah. But in the context of Ukrainian fighting, this may be just the perfect weapon because you actually yeah. do not want to have any large uh, kind of military installations that are visible and could be attacked. Correct. Um, and somebody has predicted this. So Javelin is one of the programs I have some knowledge of through my day job. They're making a lot of them. They started making a lot of them, a lot more of them not too long ago, which was really interesting. Okay. 
That's actually an interesting question. So I understand that Ukraine gave up its Soviet nuclear weapons in 1996 based on assurances from Russia that would not attack Ukraine. I expect they now regret that decision. So the assurances is something called the Budapest Agreement, and I'll let Eugene talk about it a little bit. I think he knows more about it than I do. Uh, but the gist of it is that it wasn't just Russia. It was United States, UK, Russia, Ukraine, and somebody else. I don't remember who else. And they all said, nobody's going to attack you. You can give up the nukes. The part of it that I'm not sure of, if what I understand is correct, those were Soviet nukes and not like Ukrainians had the ability to launch them, although they may have, I don't know. But they did have nukes and they gave them up. And the fact that they did to me is stunning, right? So when Americans negotiate with Russians, they think that anything that Russians sign has value, right? They just can't fathom that Russians are just, what's Chinese for that matter, or, you know, or Persian or Iranians, they Americans can't fathom that the other side is just straight out lying. But Ukrainians should know better. Uh, well, I think you have to understand the context. This was ninety six, uh, so there was no kind of aggressive, uh, revenge Soviet uh, trend within Russia. Assumption was that most countries want to move towards West. And Ukraine was forced, uh, they were told that if you want to be members of, uh, uh, you know, Europe, if you don't want any impediments, uh, you have to take non-proliferation seriously, and this is the price to pay. So yes, they definitely regret it, regret it right now, but just to be clear, there was kind of very specific pressure put on them. It was not, uh, would you like to give them up? And they said, sure, no problem, take them. Okay, uh, that, that's fair. So do you know what the terms of the deal was? If somebody attacks you, were we supposed to help them out? Or do you know what, what, yeah. what were the assurances? Well, the, that's a problem with all of those deals. Uh, kind of, I don't have memorized the terms, but uh, my understanding is that it was a general assurance. Uh, mm -hmm. It wasn't uh, even NATO kind of, we, I would like to see trial by fire. If, if Russia attacks one of the Baltic countries, how quickly... Uh, NATO comes to its defense, but this was nowhere near as solid as NATO. Okay. This was kind of general assurance of support. So, so it's, for all we know, it could have been something like, if you get attacked by an aggressive reconstituting Russian empire, we will think of a million different super mild sanctions that we can wave in the air every once in a while. Okay. I, I, I think it specifically called out military support, but it was far from kind of immediate trigger. Like in NATO, okay. you invoked Article 5, and all NATO mm -hmm. countries must honor this. Yeah, and so it wasn't Article 5 just invoked, it was that, no, Article 4 was just invoked. Four. Four, yeah. Five is better than four. Yeah. Well, suppose that to invoke five, you have to first invoke four. It's one of those sequential okay. things that Germans like. All right, let's see. I'm, I'm looking through the comments. Oh, I don't know about this. Uh, in 2004 or 5, Senator Obama pushed the bill that helped destroy more than 15,000 tons of ammunition, 400,000 small arms, and 1,000 anti aircraft missiles in Ukraine. Stuff they're missing now. I don't know anything about this. Uh, me neither. Uh, yeah, I cannot comment on this. I, I would have to research it. Yeah, I, uh, I'm sorry. I wish I knew I don't. Oh, that's interesting. So about an hour ago, the European Union announced that MiG and SU aircraft, similar to what Ukraine uses, will be supplied, presumably, to the Ukraine. Willingness is from several states, Bulgaria, Czech Republic. So basically, some other intermarium countries who have a non-theoretical uh, knowledge of what it is being a Russian neighbor. Though well, Bulgaria technically doesn't have a border with Russia. But... Mm -hmm. They've been involved. Uh, if uh, I'll look it up, uh, hopefully that's accurate. Hopefully they will be able to provide meaningful uh, support. Let's see. Uh, nothing interesting there. Yeah, more discussion of the fact that <laughs> Drew, if Ukraine wants to irritate Putin. All of the Russian equipment Ukraine kept just painted pink and leave it on the border. So while I like the idea, they should paint it with a rainbow flag. I think Putin would like that even more. And I strongly suspect that Putin is sufficiently irritated. He's not going to get more irritated than he already is. That could be wrong, of course. I'm, I'm, I'm actually curious to understand current... Uh, uh... 
state of uh, Russian strength of their force. Uh, my understanding is that they threw all their best units at the first wave because that was the overwhelming bet. And by now, it's a safe assumption that most of them have been dispatched. So kind of what, what's, what's the next phase? Throwing uh, more untrained troops and uh, increasing 5x casualties with very little... I don't, I don't know. Like I said, this is the part of it that is absolutely stunning to me. Like there is no depth to this plan. And then, you know, say what you will about Putin and company. You, like I'm not, I'm not used to thinking of them as morons, right? Yeah. Like, I, I was always under the assumption that they are very, very unpleasant people, but they're not idiots. This, the way this is going on is so mind numbingly stupid. Once again, you know, looking from the other side of Atlantic Ocean and all that. But mm -hmm. it makes really you know, no sense. So here's a good question. Is it an impression that Russian citizens want this war or is this all only coming from the top brass of Russia? Or let's say you're purely political. Uh, well, uh, I mean, it's very hard to tell. Obviously, it's very difficult to do polling in Russia. What impressed me and why I was, uh, I really thought it's not going to happen until the day it happened because I didn't see the usual build-up of propaganda on the Russian side. Russia was openly saying this invasion is not going to happen, while they didn't hide their contempt for Ukraine. It was far from what you would expect as pre-war uh, propaganda efforts. And indeed, from kind of talking to POWs, you see, you see their videos, uh, they're explaining that uh, they were told that they're taking part in a training exercise, until in some cases they were already dropped within Ukraine. And then they were told what their mission is, which is like a crazy way to demoralize your troops before the fight. I kind of, I, it's, again, it's kind of mind boggling if this is true. And it seems like it's pervasive because I've seen two dozen videos of POWs stating more or less the same story. And yeah, that's once again, like something that doesn't compute. But then again, you know, uh, going back to uh, American issues, when the Afghanistan pullout was orchestrated and the way it was done, I also couldn't believe it was so stunningly stupid that we did it, right? So, yeah, and I don't know if it's the same level of stupidity, you know, but it's up there. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, I guess, uh, the, the yes, yeah. So, Drew, so what's the gain? What did Putin hope to get out of this other than 50 million pissed off Ukrainians taking over the country? This is you know, 800 AD. Okay, so Putin has publicly stated multiple times that he believes that the dissolution of the Soviet Union was a geopolitical disaster and a mistake, and he wants to reconstitute it as the Russian Empire. Soviet Union was a new name for a Russian Empire. It was just a different czar, effectively, right? And Ukraine is was a very, very significant part of its second largest by population, second most important of the Soviet republics. And Putin wants it back. Uh, I do not know if this is his delusions of grandeur, but um, something you have to understand in the East, uh, 50 million of pissed off people means just more slave labor in the camps if they don't comply, right? Uh, but in the modern world, how he thought he was going to pacify this country, I don't know, as Eugene was pointing out earlier, this is a mind-numbing failure of intelligence, really. Well, it's pretty clear that he actually did believe there is significant support from ethnically Russian part of Ukraine. It must have been part of the bet. There is, there is no way uh, that he thought that everybody is going to unite against him and they will walk in. Uh, it didn't happen, which is, that's a mind-boggling part. But what he believed is probably that, that there is going to be some, you know, half of the... Mind, the mind-boggling part is how he came to believe that, right? Because once yeah. again, this is not a place where it's hard to co to collect intelligence. Yeah, not, not, not at all. Yeah. Okay, so this is an interesting question. So Putin still has the last card to play, which is the nuclear power, I guess. We don't want to think about it, but it is real. This is really... Uh, <laughs> This is really an interesting question, right? So Putin is 70 years old. He is in the twilight of his career, life, etc. Is he willing to just burn it all if he doesn't get his way? Well, so nuclear launch bottle, buttons, uh, they specifically put at the distance so it takes two people to press. So I guess my hope is that uh, kind of it's physically the case, but also metaphorically, usually it takes several people to approve such actions. And my claim if 
people around them that mainly enjoy very good life and that's why they're in this game if they notice that he is on a suicidal streak uh you, you can always put too much polonium on your team that's that's fair so like like th this whole thing is so stupid that i'm every once in a while in a very conspiratorial way i'm wondering whether this is somebody just started this to have a pretext to get Putin out of power right I mean, that's it, 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 that's a complicated conspiracy theory. I'll I'll grant you that. Yeah, I, I mean, look, there is a some slim chance of him uh, somehow being able to follow through. Uh, there is no question that everybody around him are not on board. This is not a religious cult. Yeah. So this, um, so this is sort of a reiteration of what we just uh, discussed uh, from Jason. It seems very odd that Russia is not able to take Ukraine quickly, which doesn't make sense from my uneducated perspective. Either I we completely underestimate Ukraine, or Russia is not a power without it once was. It will be interesting to see how it shakes out. Yeah, it will be interesting to see how it shakes out. And I think you're right on both statements. Uh, most people don't do underestimate what Ukraine is and overestimate what Russia is, I think. Uh, sorry, but when we're talking about Russia, no, uh, not what it once was, uh, what exactly are we talking about? World War II? Uh, Russia laid down, you know, 20 million people uh, during this war. So it's not that they were overwhelmingly efficient. They were willing to kill a lot of people. So I don't know. It's It was always the trade of kind of Russian military. They were very generous with casualties. And, uh, yeah. So the, there was a joke circulating a while back if there was, you know, text messaging or something, Facebook, during World War II, how different countries were commenting. I'll dig it up at some point. It's still funny. But one of the phrases there was from Stalin. He says, you motherfuckers, you do not understand how many people I have in this country and how little I care about their lives. Right. And that's basically it. If Russia, if there was enough popular support in Russia, if it still had the population control that Soviet Union did, and it really wanted to take over Ukraine, it would. It would be long and it would be bloody. But ultimately, 100 million Russians will be able to kill 50 million Ukrainians. Right? Yeah. How many people are there in Russia now? About 100 million? 120. Either 100 high 20s or low 30s. Okay, so Russia has roughly three times the population of Ukraine, but Ukraine is still 44 million people. It is not like taking over San Marino, right, which is one block. It is a big country. It's one of the larger countries in Europe, I think, or the largest. Is Germany larger than Ukraine population? Yes, by far. Yeah, Ger yeah Germany is larger, right? So, mm -hmm. so Germany and France, I think, are larger, and that's it. Maybe uh, UK, no, maybe if you UK counted, better. maybe if you counted Europe, they're trying to say they're not European. So, yeah, so. right. So, third largest country in Europe by population. It's not chump change. And if and if Ukrainians are determined, can you, you know, even if they were successful taking out the leadership, would the country just lay down and give up? I'm not so sure. Well, uh, I guess militarily speaking, well, this was departure from typical Soviet doctrine. So, Soviet doctrine always. <laughs> relied on overwhelming firepower and indiscriminate use of force and huge tank assaults, etc. Right? Like, for instance, in the Russian art artillery does grid suppression, where they literally take square by square block and they just suppress the whole block. There is no notion of precise fire, etc. Uh, and, and this is the model. Now, Putin went into Ukraine uh, with very different model in mind. The goal was to kind of win hearts and minds just to a degree. And uh, so on one hand, shock and awe for those who are fighting, but overall, it was not a scorched earth campaign. And this is a, that's a different model. And I don't think they ever demonstrated ability to done it successfully. For instance, second Chech Chechen war, they just put batteries outside major cities and essentially level cities, which sometimes would take weeks and then go in. That's a model. Correct. Remember, I keep on talking about the value of human life in the East being different than in the West. Well, there's your example. Yeah. Uh, so it's a good comment from Stephanie. I find it remarkable uh, that so many Russian citizens are protesting this war in Russia. Uh, protesting Putin in Russia takes a lot of courage and resolve. And that is very true. There are, like here, we have people protesting everything, right? And uh, and they are all talking about their bravery. You can go out in the streets here and protest 
anything you want and you're in no danger. It doesn't take any bravery. It gives you a lot of self-satisfaction. Bravery is not involved. If you are out in the streets of Moscow protesting Putin's aggression in Russia, you are really risking, uh, risking a lot. Yeah, Russia is more like Canada. <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so so I tried to tell me that I was comparing uh, uh, our erstwhile Canadian dictator with Kim Jong Un. Uh, erroneously, should have been comparing him to Putin. All right. Okay. Uh, let's see. So Drew uh, is asking: Are they really at risk of being harmed or killed? Yes, very much so. And not in the in, in not in a nice, sweet, quick, and painless way. Russia has a long history of making this fun for everybody but the subject. So, I, I mean, officially, uh, Russia, at least kind of that's what media says. I do not know what it means in terms of people arrested. Mm -hmm. I think last time I checked, there was 1,800 people arrested in Russia for protesting. Mm -hmm. uh, so right now, they claim that this is equivalent to treason, which carries a death sentence. I do not believe that they're literally going to execute 1,800 people, but uh, the risk is obviously there. It's not of an equal to protesting in Russia during normal times. That's probably fair. And uh, if they really wanted to, it's not hard for Russians to disappear. 1,800 people may not be worth the effort, but not like not something they haven't done before. So Virgil, could this be the last gasp of a failing Russian state, possibly the final aggressive, desperate push to make something happen? Good question. Maybe. I to, to be honest, I don't think that it was anywhere near failing immediately. Uh, I think this was a gamble. For some reason, Putin felt very good about making this bet, uh, which is puzzling to me because it's, again, it's like a, militarily it's puzzling, but politically it's a very, very dangerous bet that's completely unwarranted. There was no pressing. The, the amazing thing is that like the what he did with the Donetsk and Lugansk, he recognized those two, you know, breakaway republics. He could have waited a couple of years, maybe bite off a little bit more territory. He's got the Crimea, who could have shaken some nuclear weapons. He could have kept on getting chunks of Ukraine, eastern Ukraine, and without too much real pushback from the West, by doing this gamble, he risked everything he's gotten so far. Yeah, Putin was very successful operating on kind of margins of our indecision, doing yeah. just enough that it's like clearly bad, but not bad enough to do something risky by Western countries. And this was working. He like stopped Georgia from joining uh, NATO. He had a conflict in uh, Ukraine. He suppressed uh, uh, overthrow in uh, both uh, Belarus and Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. uh, the system was working. Uh, it's not clear why he chose to risk it all. Yeah, this is uh, like that. This is really weird. Uh, so what is that? China just helped Russia with a northern power plant, costing something like 120 billion US dollars worth. Could this be part of China's request compensation instead of money? So China is sort of an interesting player here. So China at first was kind of trying to toe the line of supporting Russia, but not openly supporting Russia, but absolutely not talking about Ukraine. And I'm hearing some reverberations that all of a sudden Chinese press is talking a bit more about Ukrainian resistance in positive terms. So something is happening. Ultimately, one of the things that I think is most likely to happen as a result of this is that Russian relationship with the West is going to go down the drain and it's basically going to become a guest station for China, above all. And then what do you think? Well, uh, I, I, for me, kind of China's play politically was the most kind of interesting part because I wasn't sure if, if Russia by itself very much can fall Putin's regime, I mean, as a result mm -hmm. of this, but can China for, afford for Russia to fall? And what would it look like if China doesn't want to? And uh, this morning I was talking to a friend uh, from China and uh, she mentioned that uh, as of today, words Ukrainian hero was allowed to appear in Chinese media, which was very much a kind of strong signal in the direction that China doesn't want to be associated with uh, yeah. this failure. Doesn't mean that China is changing anything in the general scheme of things, but at least this conflict they don't want to have. Well, I mean, China doesn't. For China needs oil and gas 
primarily and a few other things from Russia. They don't need Putin, not like he's personally hand delivering all that stuff, right? Uh, Putin is useful. He's okay, I'm, I'm sure he is, but uh, I don't think China would have any trouble finding somebody else to sell them oil and gas sitting in the same chair as Putin is sitting in now. Huh? Okay, there we go. So China is, uh, has a better insight into China than I do. Uh, China is in a very tough spot now. Putin does not want China get involved a single bit because it can possibly turn the tide just like NATO involvement. Perhaps. Okay, so Drew is still trying to figure out uh, what rights Russians have in Russia. Whatever rights Putin gives you, that's what you have. It's not this. It's not this. It's not the same kind of a place as America. There is no right to protest in Russia. I don't know. I mean, I mean there is a practical a, one. Exactly. Yeah. On the paper, it's very easy to look up which rights you have, but in practice, your rights are always subject to whomever is in charge. Like, like you know, in Canada, as Eugene has correctly pointed out, technically you kind of have a right to protest. Unless you're protesting against Justin Trudeau, then he invokes emergency powers and goes all dark through this, and we have Order 66 and all sorts of weird shit happening, right? Uh, in the United States, we have the Constitution. We don't use it very much, but we do have it, right? In Russia, what they have is barely a Constitution. So, and Stephanie, I get your sarcasm still. Kudos to the Russians of good conscience standing up to Putin. Yes, uh, good for them. I'm not sure if I would have the, have had the guts, but... I, I mean, I guess more practically, uh, it's, it's uh, yeah, obviously it's very hard for me to see. Uh, I, if Putin regime was to be toppled, that's not going to be by mass demonstrations storming Kremlin. It's going to be by somebody in his interior deciding mm -hmm. it's not in their interest to have him as a leader. So in that sense, I kind of, I don't think this is one of the possible vectors. So there's going to be a mass protest. Yeah, that, that's, that is a fair point. So once again, this is something Americans don't fully understand. One of the big things about civilized countries is the transfer of power happens in a civilized way usually supported by a large number of people in russia transfer of power happens quietly behind the scenes and then everybody's told right there is a big pretense of elections and things like that i'm not so sure any of that is yeah is real i guess one thing that i want to caution people about so Ukraine was overperforming compared to anybody's expectations, including my expectations. Maybe not Dmitry, because he uh, believed all along that that's how it's going to go. Uh, it, war is not over yet, not by long shots. So there is still a chance that Russia will use overwhelming force and Kharkov will fall in my mind. Uh, obviously, I don't want it to happen, but uh, I have no idea. Kind of, I, I, do, I believe there is more brute force that Russia can use. That's, so far that's fair, that. yes. I'd be hesitant to use. So yeah, so I don't want to be kind of in prematurely celebratory mode that the campaign failed. Campaign was significantly set back, but it's not over yet. Well, we'll know. We should know soon what they're going to do next, right? Because uh, once again, looking at, at it, I'm not sure how many options Putin has. And, and to be fair, I don't really have any insight into his mind. Right, no. but he can't just pull back. Um, well, okay, so so here's a few possible scenarios. So there is uh, Zelensky agreed to negotiations. I would love to see what this is going to look like because obviously he cannot come back to Ukrainian people after everything that happened and said that he recognizes Crimea and Luhansk and uh, Donetsk and he is willing to disarm and this is how he's going to end the conflict, right? That's non-starter for Ukrainians. And what would be a reasonable set of terms for Russia? Right? We went in and uh, Zelensky is in power and he maintains military but promises not to join NATO. Well, he was not on the path to join NATO to begin with. So it's not clear what, what they're getting. So I, I do not know what negotiations can achieve unless there is very creative kind of statements that could be read very differently on two. Well, I mean, so far I didn't see that 
bilateral agreement or negotiations. Ukrainians basically went, okay, we can do negotiations without any uh, prior conditions, right? Lukashenko said we can do negotiations as soon as Ukrainians lay down arms. Uh, Russians, I, I was listening to an interview with the Ukraine, I think, foreign minister, something like that, before we started here. And he was saying that Russia had some really weird ass requirements for these negotiations. So negotiations will happen eventually, but I'm not so sure we are that close to them. Right. Well, so, so meanwhile, uh, I think that Russian military is growing desperate and I think they're running out of viable troops. And where troops cannot do the, the artillery camp, uh, they may have to switch to their more Soviet model and try to level Kharkov, for instance. Uh, that would not surprise me too much. But once again, if they're trying to avoid dragging the West really into it, leveling Kharkov uh, may not be the way to do so. But we'll see. So Brooks Precision. I saw a report that someone on the Communist Party tweeted they were against the invasion. That would be the first time a communist is against an invasion. Uh, but I don't know. Maybe. Which communist Party of which country? Uh, any of them, really. Well, I mean, it would mean different things. Because I think that uh, somebody on the Russian Communist Party, it's uh, one type of signal. If Chinese Communist Party says they're against invasion, that would be very interesting turn of events. If somebody from U.S. Communist Party does something, who cares? Well, I mean, if it's Chinese Communist Party, then the question is whether they're against the invasion of Taiwan, because that's the next big thing, right? So if I this think. Ukrainian thing proceeds and the West does not get involved, are the Chinese going to go after uh, Taiwan, right? Well, I mean, I think the way it's going, it's already providing... I, I would be shocked if China watching this decides now is the time to take on Taiwan. Uh, given how not well this operation is proceeding. Uh, they will try again in some time. I just don't think yeah. they will feel today is the day. Well, I mean, Taiwan has a good number of people, reasonably willing populace, and it's a freaking island, and you have to be really good at amphibious operations to take it. Right. The military operation to take Taiwan would be very, very difficult. Yeah. Not impossible, once again, if you're willing to destroy the whole thing. If you want to take Taiwan and use it, it's hard. If you want to make Taiwan into basically one large landing strip with everything flat, I mean, that's that's doable. So let's see what else we have. Oh, that's an interesting comment. So Russia has an old angry drunk for a leader and the US has an old demented angry drunk. This may not end well. So to the best of my knowledge, Putin is not really a drinker. In fact, he doesn't touch alcohol. Yeah. Uh, and with Biden, I'm not sure what difference alcohol would make. I mean, He's a senile fool, and uh, the only difference recently is that he's senile. He was always a fool. The politics in the U.S. are interesting, right? The new breed of a modern uh, American politician is basically a charismatic imbecile, right? So that's the Every once in a while, we get one who is not an imbecile, and it's nice. Uh, but the general uh, personality profile to get elected, you basically have to be likable, and uh, completely unknowledgeable of anything, right? That way you can never lie. You can say anything you want and you do not know that this is bullshit. All right, where are we next? That's an interesting. So Mr. Mark 82 is proceeding with the line of thinking that Russia is not using their best troops. Uh, so that's not entirely accurate. So traditionally, uh, when Russia's most elite units fail, they then, when the mass attack starts, they start putting in cannon fodder first. Uh, sorry, I mean, at this point, it's not hypothetical. We know names of the yeah. units that took part in the first wave. Those are by far the elite, like alpha unit uh, of interior is equivalent to our Delta Force. I mean, we don't have I guess similar unit. We don't have interior as an armed force, uh, but yeah. equivalent of Delta Force uh, in the United States. So uh, no, not by a long shot. I think that's uh, kind of historically. I'm not sure if historically it's exactly the case. Uh, definitely in Afghanistan, it was paratroopers who went in first, who were elite forces, etc. Uh, maybe in some specific battles, this was the case. Okay. 
Now, the most important question, does Ukraine make any scopes apart for a scope that I might need and not be able to get for a little while? Ukraine does make some optics. Uh, most of them are not available in the United States. Uh, the Eastern Bloc optics that you see in the United States are either made in uh, Russia or Belarus, And uh, there is nothing there that you absolutely must have. So. Okay, interesting. So, angry, angry drunk is a euphemism for someone who easily becomes combative. Now, this is actually an interesting point, right? Uh, because Putin was never, never had, had the reputation of someone who becomes easily combative. Right, uh, you like or dislike the guy, he was never a fool and he was never easily provoked, and he was a um, we can say evil, nefarious character, but uh, with some foundational principles that I may disagree with. But he was never, he was never easily combative or an idiot, right? So, this. <laughs> And I don't know if it has changed or not. Uh, but, uh, I, I had a conversation with a friend of mine who was watching Putin's address and he got visibly angry uh, talking about uh, Ukraine and uh, United States, frankly. I was mm -hmm. surprised how much of his address had to do with United States as the enemy. Uh, and uh, I maintain that this is still a kind of facade. That's what he wanted to project. He's fully in control of his emotions. Uh, my friend claimed that no, that looked genuine. So it is true, though, that it's very unusual. Typically, he always was very unemotional. Well, I mean, he may, maybe age, maybe disease, maybe COVID isolation. I've even heard that argument. Maybe something is catching up with him, or maybe it's all an act. We really do not know. And given the history of the guy, we really do not know. And we have no way uh, uh, of knowing. But, you know, last 20 years suggest we should not he may have made a colossal mistake but still we should still not underestimate his uh, uh, his abilities let's see what else we got uh we're getting close to two hours guys so we'll be wrapping up in a few minutes if there are any more questions for you junior i uh, now's the time let's see uh stephanie yes china's reaction is a key question I'm sure China was watching the reaction of the West to all of this with great interest. Yeah, and I found the reaction of the West deeply unencouraging, but we'll see where that goes. Uh, well, initially, definitely. I think we're very hesitant to spell out when we're going to do what, etc. Uh, at this point, uh, I think it's both unnecessary, it would be problematic to send troops into Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, I think equipment is about the right. Yeah. Uh, level of help at the moment and it seems like that is forthcoming so today i actually think that it's looking reasonable is us sending something yes i mean we're committed to 350 million of military aid and okay. 150 of humanitarian and uh and in general i think 28 european countries uh agreed to provide military aid many of them were against sanctions altogether before that so okay. as of today uh, both united states and eu i think doing what is correct uh, leading up to the invasion i thought the messaging was mixed and unclear and too hypothetical so it definitely was not a deterrent but, I mean, long term, it still all boils down to they all depend on Russian oil and gas, Germany being the most prominent example. And even with the swift sanctions right now, the ones that Germany is involved with, they specifically excluded anything involved with raw material transactions, right? So yeah. what's the next step? Are they going to, what can they do to get themselves decoupled from Russian uh, oil and gas? Right. Well, I mean, long term, I do hope that they take this coupling seriously. I find the position geopolitically crazy that you shut down your own nuclear plants because of uh, concerns for environment, but you're okay. And on... yet they did it. Okay. Yeah. And yet you're pumping gas, which has the same effect just a few miles away. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, you indebted to a dictatorship for that. Uh, this kind of, this calculus makes no sense. Uh, I'm hoping they'll revisit this now that it's a little bit more clear what's at stake. Uh... Look, Biden, when Biden got elected, right, one of the first things he did, he stopped the Keystone XL pipeline and pulled a ton of permits for 
uh, drilling in the United States. So now we, United States also imports uh, some, what, 600,000 barrels per day of Russian oil, something like that. There's some, I mean, not huge by US standards, but it's fairly significant a number. I mean, Western powers seem to do this all the time. We really, really care about global warming. So we are okay if we are doing this somewhere else. I mean, yeah. this is uh, so weird. Because so global weird. warming is very localized phenomena. Oh, it's California only. I get it. Yes. So No, I, I mean, exactly. As a policy, it makes no sense because you're not reducing anything meaningful. In fact, you're shifting burden somewhere where you do not want it to be. Yeah, this is. Yeah, I think this is odd. Like, really odd. Hold on one sec. In a moment, uh, somebody message in, in, in Rumble. All right, do we have any other interesting questions there? Okay. Uh, well, this is kind of interesting. Chen, the blueprint for China is Russia invades Ukraine, NATO got involved, and it's time to take Taiwan. Yeah, I'm not so sure if that's a blueprint. I, I don't think that makes a ton of sense. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, kind of a wrong, wrong mental model. You think NATO is engaged, so they will not react. I think it's, it's, it's kind of, it's, not, it's never a question of capacity, it's a question of will. So if you have will to get engaged in one place, uh, there is less reason to think you're not going to get away, engaged in another. This is kind of, that was a fallacy of also Biden's justification of pulling out of Afghanistan, but this will free us up somewhere else. So uh, after World War II, U.S. had this, uh, what well, something used to be called the two-war doctrine, where we were supposed to maintain enough military capacity to maintain two wars simultaneously. If I remember, that was officially dealt away with uh, during the Obama years. Is that right? No, uh, it's still the doctrine. It's still a doctrine? I thought that Obama officially took it out. Um, no. At least, uh, to the best of my knowledge, no, this is officially okay. still a doctrine. And uh, I think that's probably correct in terms of capabilities. Yeah. It sounds like, you know, given that we have two oceans, we sort of need to be able to, God forbid, be able to wage war on both sides. That's sort of where it came from. And uh, I'm... Given that our military a year ago announced that their biggest problem is global warming, I'm not so convinced we are ready for two wars, but we'll see what we'll see what happens there. Jared. Uh, if Ukraine wasn't planning on joining NATO before this, if they survive this war, it would seem certain they will join now. It's not like um, joining NATO is not like you raise your hand and say, okay, I'm now part of NATO. I don't. There are other requirements to this, right? Well, so number one, uh, NATO never takes on new members that have ongoing uh, political disputes or border disputes, I should say, with mm -hmm. anybody, which was 100% uh, the calculation with Putin starting war in Ossetia and uh, Lugansk, Donetsk. This by itself precludes any NATO membership. So uh, today there is no active process happening with respect to Ukraine. And after this conflict, I think NATO is happy to probably provide assistance if it goes well, rebuild Ukraine, etc. Uh, but I really doubt that they will immediately be allowed to join. I mean, it depends what happens with Russia. If this is truly downfall of of Putin, then uh, everything is possible. I'm kind of I think this is a little bit of wishful thinking at the moment. Yeah, look, I mean, fundamentally, Russia wants Belarus and Ukraine is their buffer between them and Europe. Uh, and if they control Russia and Ukraine, then that's the case. Europe, in the grand scheme of things, maybe not so consciously uh, wants Belarus and Ukraine to be their buffer between them and Russia. If Russia controls Ukraine, then Europe's buffer becomes Poland. Which has never worked out well for Poland, really. Um, Which is the reason why Poland was first to provide military aid to Ukraine yeah. during this conflict. Because they, yeah, they exactly, right. And uh, honestly, if Russia was, once again, this is very far-fetched, but if Russia were successful in taking over Ukraine, I 
would not have been terribly surprised to see some of the Western Ukraine not become part of Poland again, like it was before World mm -hmm. War II, because there's strong cultural differences between Western Ukraine and Eastern Ukraine. I mean, I, I don't think Russia will uh, allow uh, separation to take place in the take over Ukraine. In fact, the, the model is going to be not formally becoming part of Russia, but it's going to be a puppet government. Uh, supposedly, yes. Yeah. But if Europe pays a little bit more attention to this, we can see Ukraine divided like Germany used to with Western and Eastern Germany, right? It's not very likely, but for Europe, it would be a better, a much better situation than a uh, completely uh, Russia-dominated Ukraine. Okay. All right. Uh, Drew, thank you, Eugene, for coming on and helping to answer these concerning and important questions. I have seen the theater of war three times. I don't want that for anybody. So, Drew, I didn't know that you served. Uh, when you have a chance, uh, tell me where you ended up serving. So, hmm? well, uh, yeah, when I was talking to Dmitry earlier today, uh, he mentioned Eugene, you know, war, and I told him, not really, not in the same sense. Uh, taking part in Iraq uh, invasion is not the same as fighting kind of right now on Ukrainian side against Russians. So, yeah, there are wars and there are wars. Yeah. So I have a question on Rumble. Unfortunately, that can't be displayed here, so I'll, I'll read it out uh, from Rick. Uh, any insight on the Azov Battalion? What is Azov Battalion? I'm not sure what that is. Uh, I know what Azov C is, but... Right, it's a Ukrainian Special Forces unit. Okay. And do you have any insight on them? Uh, supposedly, they did amazingly well in the last few kind of combat operations. They, uh, I forgot, I was just I was, uh, listening to audio recording of some Russian guy describing uh, their losses uh, to somebody, which sounded completely staggering. And his claim was that uh, kind of this wave after wave was uh, crushed by Azov Battalion. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do not know much about the composition of the battalion. But based on his words, this was both Ukrainian and uh, foreign fighters, which seems plausible. There are definitely both Georgian battalions and Chechen battalions mm -hmm. in the Ukrainian military. Uh, so I, and I know there are some U.S. Special Forces guys who themselves chose to join. There is no formal uh, Correct, yeah. military. They just, they're just on vacation. Like Azov Sea, Black Sea, it's a beautiful place to have vacation. Right, yeah. So I do not know the composition of Azov uh, uh, Battalion, but it seemed to be a uh, kind of a reasonable combat unit. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Thank you. Uh, Ted, it's a very informative discussion. Thank you, Ted. Thank you for joining and sticking around for how oh, two hours. It's awesome. Uh, Jared, <laughs> only one certain way to prevent Russia from being concerned over NATO expansion. Let them join, then NATO will be as useless as the United Nations. That's an interesting way of uh, thinking about it. I had not thought about that. Well, I, I mean, I think it's a very interesting point, because if you ask most Russians who will try to justify the invasion, they'll tell you that they were forced because NATO was on their doorsteps. And uh, kind of in their mind, NATO is... Um, single-minded uh, military organization that has objectives. In reality, it's a bunch of kind of bickering states that have some political commonalities and are willing to help each other. So Once in a blue moon, not all the time. Exactly. So joining NATO to me is a little bit like joining UN. Obviously not as heterogeneous, but it's not the case that we'll have a single general in charge of all NATO forces who kind of able well, to rule. I mean, it's not quite like joining UN. Like NATO is kind of a mess. UN is just a pile of horseshit. I mean, when Russia sits, they, they veto stuff in the Security Council. I mean, sure, but but uh, given how much effort it takes to cudgel UN for to any action, and when they do, it's again like it's usually very asymmetric. It the, the, yeah, that uh, that's fair. But but uh, to Jared's point, if we get, let's say. Russia, China, and Iran to join uh, NATO, then it becomes kind of like you. Yeah. I mean, but that was exactly the plan in the 90s, right? They were, NATO was very actively courting Russia. And the idea was that, uh, you know, you, there is no need to have... Uh, NATO is not fundamentally anti-Russian organization. It's a defensive alliance. Whoever is the enemy. So if Russia wasn't planning to be the enemy, it would have nothing to do with defending from Russia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is very, very, very true. 
And Steven, bullets for bucks. Late to the stream, is media accurately portraying the conflict? Do Ukrainians really want to resist Russia? It is more of a civil war dynamics. Didn't the Ukraine bomb their own people? So since we are almost done, let's use this question as this sort of final statement. And then we are at almost two hours. Then we'll wrap up and I'll let Stephen rewatch uh, the live stream afterwards. So final parting thoughts on Ukraine and Russia. Uh, did Ukraine bomb its own people? Uh, we're talking about Lugansk, Donetsk, or what's, uh, which context? So look, it, it's, uh, it's a conflict. Bad things happen in the conflict. I do not believe that uh, at any point Ukraine was involved in genocide or any kind of other atrocities. Uh, do I believe that the shell could be fired from Ukraine that kills civilians in Lugansk, Donetsk? Yes. Uh, I mean, unfortunately, I've seen uh, enough civilian casualties. I know how they happen. And uh, this is with very disciplined U.S. forces that never intend to do this. Uh, in Eastern Europe, as Eastern Europe, I do think there is more room for uh, kind of loose attitude towards uh, civilian casualties. But again, like nothing rising to the level of Russian propaganda. What this was uh, tends amount to genocide or kind of uh, specific massacres of civilians. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, there will be friendly fire casualties. There will be friendly fire casualties on both sides. Um, with Donetsk and Lugansk, you really don't know. They Do they consider themselves part of Ukraine or not? Ukraine does, right? They probably don't. Does the media portray this accurately? Even without looking very much at how media portrays it, the answer is probably no. I don't think media these days portrays anything accurately. Uh, but it is not a guerrilla warfare. It is a real war between two reasonably major powers and so far it is going uh, amazingly badly for russia uh we'll keep track on what's happening and if there are any new developments if eugene is up to it maybe we'll repeat this in a couple of days so or sometime during this coming week as time allows and see what happens i have a suspicion that we might see everything bogged down for a few days but uh, perhaps not perhaps i'm wrong if there is anything we didn't cover, please post it in the comments and I'll do my best uh, to pull it up and respond. And thank you for all of you who stuck with us for nearly two hours. I do appreciate it. You have a good evening, guys. Thank you.